thank you for clicking on this video. I appreciate your interest and hope that everything in this video will confirm or add to what you want to know, possibly already know, about the beautiful orchid genus Brassavola. This is a genus name that I love, Brassavola. It fits the beautiful growth habit of these orchids and the simplistic elegance of the blooms, which are enhanced in their attractiveness by the delicious fragrances that the majority of them exude. Describing the characteristics of the orchid within the Brassavola genus and hybrids of the same are so reminiscent of the understated but classy Italian design. The whole less is more, which is repeated throughout anything Italian, is evident in every single Brassavola orchid. The balance of lines, the striking details that enhance something that looks simple but is intricate in its makeup, complemented by a fragrance that most of the time crosses all the T's and dots all the I's, made Robert Brown, who named this genus either very intuitive when he chose who to name the genus after, or also understood that Italian craftsmanship in design was the only way to describe these orchids with the single word, Brassavola, which is the surname of an Italian physician and botanist, Antonio Musa Brassavola. His surname, ironically, has several accepted formats, which we could consider synonyms if he were an orchid. Even though the genus is officially spelled Brassavola, which was his surname, <laughs> If you were to search for Antonio Musa and stumble across Brassavoli or Brassavola, know that this would be one and the same person who the genus was named after. Simply said, he had like three surnames, one of which had a double S in it, and that is Brassavola, and that is what Robert Brown chose to name this genus after. Now, to my understanding, there are 21 species, but I have seen 24 listed elsewhere. <sighs> However, just like the name bearer with his several surnames, there are a few synonyms that overlap between species names and synonyms. So, Blaise Zeroni, thank you for filling out the orchid details form, which prompted this video, because Considering your questions and interest in this genus, I could write a novel or make a video. I chose the latter. And furthermore, in order to get in as much information as possible, I have devised care cards for every species, including some that may overlap because of their synonyms, as could be the case with Brassavola fasciculata, as opposed to Brassavola venosa. Some of the species on the cards may be the same, which could also be Brassavola nodosa variety venosa, <laughs> but seeing as this is about Brassavolas, I'm going to include some species that could be varieties. When it comes to information, the less is more, as per Italian style, does not apply. <laughs> As with the Insidium General Care video, the cards have stamps on them identifying easy or expert, just to alert to the temperature requirements. It is generally said that Brassavolas are easy to grow, and they truly are. Still, when it comes to some species that can tolerate lower temperatures, the expert level is just to create awareness that lower temperatures with high humidity requirements do bring along an additional set of challenges which is the balance of airflow. Anyway, the care cards will appear at random in alphabetical order and each one will be followed with the characteristics of the species so that not only Blaise Soroni can see which one could be an ideal fit for their growth space and environment, but anyone else watching this video. Right at the end of the video, I'm going to answer the questions in the orchid detail form that have not been covered 100% in the care cards. I will answer them in bullet points to get to each one very specifically. Timestamps, as always, are in the description. Now, I know that this was a long-winded intro. I know. And I appreciate that you're taking the time to watch and or listen. But I have to take into consideration that someone may come across the video and is new to the channel for the first time here. Someone who has not seen the Insidium General Care video and is not familiar as to how I break down care information in a video. I have a total of, I think, 52 cards popping up randomly for the duration of the video. And information that I have not specified in the care cards is the elevation at which each species is found in their natural habitat, or their exact native habitat for that matter. In general, they are native to low-lying coastal regions of Central and Southern America, 
very widespread throughout Mexico to Colombia, as well as the Caribbean coast and islands, ranging all the way down to Brazil, Bolivia, and Peru. So, seeing as they are so widespread, having determined their temperature range and humidity, those are the two factors that I would consider key when it comes to their care. Once again, I'm going to emphasize that the lower end of the temperature range for some of the species still has very high humidity requirements, and for that reason should have more airflow to counteract any possible rot, even when watering is reduced because of the temperatures being lower. All Brassavola species can be found at elevations ranging from sea level, but rarely above 1,000 meters, in tropical climates or tropical drier climates. So, you can see there are two different tropical environments in which they are found, one being tropical wet, meaning high humidity, warmth, and a lot of rain, the other being tropical dry, meaning high humidity, but periods of no precipitation at all. All right, forgive me, but this video took some time to revamp my care cards for this genus, making them presentable. So I would really appreciate it if you would like the video, share it around, and if you have not subscribed, consider doing so. I do try to pack my channel content with solid information, fun times, and tutorials, which I believe would be something worthwhile subscribing to. Thank you so much in advance for your support. I really appreciate it. While you do that, I will continue with the information. The easiest and safest setup is a wet-dry cycle for the Brassavola genus. Mount it if possible, or if not possible, to take care of these orchids mounted, potted up in a very airy mix that permits a wet-dry cycle. If grown in a self-watering setup or semi-hydro, then knowing how Brassavola roots behave is super important because if growing a species, the roots of Brassavolas have a life cycle and depending on the species used in the hybrid, the hybrid will probably inherit the root life cycle of the Brassavola parent. In this genus, roots will die after three years, but that does no harm to the orchid in question. Because Brassavolas are, in general, super vigorous even as a species, because they do not per se have a rest period. If grown in their preferred temperature and light requirements, they will grow new growths, which bring new roots, while older roots peter out. It can, however, take some time to get a Brassavola to actually get its grow on. All the species that I have took a couple of years to grow, but their resilience is second to none. And even after having had them for about four years, the ones on the mount are more vigorous than the ones in the pot, and that is because of how many leads, I'll get to that, how many leads each orchid had when I received it. Once they found their mojo, they can produce multiple growth during a calendar year and each growth will bloom. Sometimes a single bloom, depending on the species, and sometimes several blooms on a spike that become more and more floriferous as the orchid ages. And here's the thing about the single lead. A Brassavola with a single lead of growth will take much longer to adapt and grow well, so it is ideal to get one that has at least two leads so that the growth of two root systems increases the strength and subsequent vigor of the orchid. If temperatures drop below their happy place, they will slow down, and it is at that stage that one would think the orchid could be going into a rest period, as would be the case here in my climate. But it is not the actual case for the genus as such. Brassavolas that slow down, stop growing their roots, are doing this to conserve energy until the conditions improve for them to continue growing. It is their way of surviving the not-so-ideal conditions. However, it is not just temperatures being inadequate that will make a Brassavola slow down, but also the lack of sufficient light. These are highlight orchids, and if used in hybridization, the highlight requirements of that hybrid need to be taken into consideration because, again, the Brassavola is strong and passes its requirements onto the hybrid, which includes fragrance if the hybrid is a primary hybrid and the ancestry of the Brassavola is not far down the parentage line. 
So know that should the light levels drop because of climate or how a grow space is respecting other orchids in a collection, the Brassavola will also slow down and appear to go into a phase of rest. And it is at that point, should that be the case, that we have to be super careful as to how to water a Brassavola. The newest roots of the newest growths will not absorb water until the next growth phase begins they will maintain their Teflon effect and it is at this point that a potted Brassavola could incur root rot because of watering too much. I just want to emphasize that I am talking about the adverse conditions being the case with what I am saying about the dangers of watering and when root rot can happen because any ideal conditions and your Brassavola will grow and keep growing during which watering, including fertilizing, is easy and abundant and should be administered in accordance to what the orchid is doing. Seeing as the easiest setup is the wet-dry cycle, which pretty much guarantees a successful culture for Brassavolas, the fertilizer levels should be relatively low. A concentration of 160 parts per million is safe. If humidity levels match and there is no danger of a rapid evaporation of the fertilizer solution, 75% and up is a great margin for humidity for the fertilizer solution to be able to be absorbed without burning the roots. Be aware of the fact that Brassavola roots do not have a characteristic of branching, so once the root tip stops growing, that is it for that root. Subsequently, keeping the root systems intact cannot be overemphasized. So of course, that goes hand in hand with the importance of flushing. However, in high humidity environments, it is only necessary once a month. And of course, the best flushing we can give a Brassavola is pure rain. If you don't grow your orchids outside and your Brassavola needs to be flushed, a good run of just plain water over the mount or through the pot will do the trick. But now we come to the conditions with little to no humidity. Brassavola need a setup or a mount that retains water over a period of time so that it creates a little humidity climate around the orchid. Now, to be on the safe side, in those instances, fertilizer levels should drop to 100 parts per million. Seeing as these wet-dry cycles are quick, it is advisable to fertilize every day. And of course, seeing as low humidity environments do not have the rain to help out with sporadic flushing, it is advisable to take on the role of the rain and flush either by misting with clean, plain water with the lowest PPM available, or if the conditions are extreme with hot, dry winds, then watering or misting the orchid during those conditions should be done several times a day to counteract the roots from frazzling and ensure that new roots will continue to grow. Now, not all is lost if a root system stops growing when the conditions are not ideal. Because roots that stop growing of their own accord based on conditions not being ideal anymore will to some degree start to extend when the conditions improve again and when the orchid starts back up with active growth of new growths. It is at that point of a new growth pushing that the velamen will be activated and absorb moisture where the root system is a season to two seasons old, as in the roots that grew on previous growth, which have finished blooming. But the extension of a root that starts as the next new growth pushes from the base will continue to maintain its Teflon effect for quite some time, while the older part will absorb water and nutrients. I have a video pointing that out and I will link that in the description because all that might sound very confusing. So check the description for a detailed video of my observation on Brassavola roots, because it is in the second year of their existence that roots become fully functional and do their job to absorb water and nutrients without repelling the water or allowing salt to accumulate on the roots that have this Teflon effect. In general, if growing Brassavola species or primary hybrids or hybrids in semi-hydro or self-watering, then the understanding of the root system is paramount to make sure that as many new roots grow into the media as quickly as possible so that they do not fail. 
Brassavola species are not abundant root growers. Again, the root system does not branch, so getting as many, if not all, roots into the pot is top priority. Luckily, the leaves are terrific, which protects them from losing too much moisture from their structures. If a root system were to fail, these are all backup plans from this orchid from Jump just to survive because if a root system were to fail, but still the new roots that get into a pot will function immediately, seeing as the velamen will be in an environment that holds onto water longer as opposed to a root system that grows on a mount. Changes in the characteristics of the velamen will prevent it from building up a Teflon effect, but this does not mean the orchid will be more vigorous. And it does not mean that brassavolas grown in self-watering or semi-hydro can tolerate higher fertilizer levels than those on a fast wet dry cycle. Seeing as the roots are not abundant, they do not branch, it is advisable to stay conservative with the fertilizer and maintain the maximum of 160 parts per million. The only advantage of growing in this setup is that the humidity environment is created by the media and increases around the orchid because of the pot itself which then results in regular misting of the roots becoming obsolete and there is no need to consider going any lower than 160 parts per million because of lack of humidity. But I do want to stress the importance of getting new roots to go into the pot otherwise any surface roots will need to be cared for exactly the same as if they were on a mount. Brassavolas have a mind of their own and so do their roots. But at least the new roots in a self-watering or semi-hydro setup will be supporting the orchid straight away and not only in the second year of their existence as is the case if the orchids were to be on a mount or in a fast wet dry cycle in organic media. Now this is a bonus for the semi-hydroponic setup because if the roots in the pot are lost at least the orchid will get moisture and nutrients straight away as opposed to an orchid that is mounted which has lost its roots and is then growing a new root system which has a Teflon effect and will keep that Teflon effect for at least a year while we wait for another new growth to develop. Now that we know that Brassavola roots have a mind of their own, it is up to us to take advantage of that knowledge and only repot, remount or do anything with a Brassavola when we see new roots growing. This way, we can be relatively safe in the knowledge that we are not going to set the orchid back or worst case scenario, lose it. But let me go back to what I mentioned earlier, that Brassavolas are very drought tolerant. A lost root system may set the orchid back, but because it is drought tolerant, because of the Tourette leaf structures, it is not necessarily a death sentence until a new growth develops a new root system. And still we have to proceed with caution. While it is true that Brassavolas are easy to grow for the most part, saying Brassavolas are a forgiving species would be exaggerating. Their slender structures work in our favor to a degree if we forget to water, or until we find the balance of humidity versus watering, but they can also work against us if the orchid is declining and reduced to only a few structures while we are trying to revive it. All structures of the Brassavola genus are not exactly abundant in their energy reserves. As a result, rot or fungus issues will take a Brassavola down very fast. But for the most part, Brassavolas are vigorous, continuous growers if the climate is conducive to making that happen. So in recap, it all sounds very detrimental, but it is not. In recap, know the Brassavola root system, make sure that it stays healthy, and with that, the rest will happen all by itself. I have had a Brassavola that was on a skinny little rhizome. I had thought it was lost. It actually belonged in the bin. And I changed my mind because I was experimenting with inorganic mounts. So I put that single rhizome on an inorganic mount. And here it is in the viewfinder. And it has grown four new growths in a span of two years. The first four being after I had mounted it. So even a rhizome is packed with energy. And I'm hoping that maybe next year the next new growth will actually produce a bloom. Because I'm not entirely sure what it is. I think I bought a Perinii, but I also have a Flagoralis, and well, maybe I mixed the two of them up, I don't know, time will tell. 
but you can also see how minimal the root system is on that orchid because it was set back due to the fact that I almost lost it. So I don't want to make it sound like a genus that is relatively easy to grow by reputation, absolutely not but as with any other orchid and even more importantly with brassavola orchids that are reluctant to grow roots we need to make sure that we keep the roots that we have growing healthy and happy for the duration of their lifespan another little thing i want to touch upon is <laughs> it happened to me because i like brassavola so much and i like frilly green bloom so much i bought a brassavola digbiana well that is now a synonym of the Brassavola. It's now called Rincolalia digbiana. The same with Brassavola glauca. It is now also called Rincolalia glauca. So off the top of my head, those are the ones I can think of when it comes to name changes and how they are listed. While their synonyms remain Brassavola and they will still be listed as such on some nursery website, they are in actual fact classified as Rincolalia digbiana and Rincolalia glauca as per the Royal Botanic Garden Q since 2003. So make no mistake about it, if you see Brassavola, Digbiana or Glauca on a nursery website, you are getting what you are buying. It is just now, they are both just reclassified to Rincolalia and there's possibly other examples out there that I don't have particularly well memorized. <laughs> Anyway, having said all of that, I hope that this video provided the answers that you were looking for, Blaze Zeroni, and anyone else that was looking for information on the Brassavola genus. If it prompted further questions, the comment section is there for a reason, so ask away. And I sincerely hope that you take advantage of the screenshot format of the care cards and species characteristic cards, which serve a great purpose for quick referral. Thank you so much for watching this video to the almost end <laughs> because I will now be answering specific questions as per the orchid details form in bullet point answers. If you're not staying around for those, know that I appreciate your time very much. That support goes a long way and hand hearts to you and a massive thank you. Wishing you a fabulous day on one condition though please that you stay safe. Take care. Bye. Having a sneaky look to the left, a sneaky look to the right, checking behind me in front of me. Don't know who stayed, but here are the answers to the specific questions as per the orchid details form. I will pop up the questions on the screen as I answer. Everybody that stayed, hi! <laughs> Bonus intel! I would grow Brassavola nodosa and flagellaris because they embody the two distinct and different bloom structures that the Brassavola genus has, but with some differentials between species and species and species. Both of these species are compact, medium-sized, beautifully fragrant, and vigorous. It is in actual fact true that all Brassavola species have similar care requirements. Some may tolerate lower temperatures, but if they don't get those low temperatures, they will not have any issues. The lower temperatures for some of them is only good to know if the grow space does drop down, giving the grower a margin of tolerance and peace of mind that those species will be fine in their collection. In a wet dry cycle, it is okay for Brassavolas to stay wet for hours during the grow season. Two hours or more is not a problem as long as they dry out before the next watering. During adverse conditions, one hour is the maximum that I would recommend. In semi-hydro and self-watering setups, the roots are always damp. Never let them dry out completely, otherwise they will die. The velamen is not used to going dry. In low humidity environments, and by that I am using the margin of less than 50%, misting is advisable three times a day during warmer temperatures and once per day during cooler temperatures, depending on your airflow. If you have no airflow, I would only mist twice, three times a week when the temperatures are cool. But if you have a lot of airflow and your humidity levels are dropping because heaters are on, then definitely give them a mist one time per day. I sincerely hope I covered everything and that these last specific answers were of additional help. Once again, the comments are there for a reason. And thank you so much for sticking around all the way to this part of the video. Take care. Bye.